There's a solar eclipse coming up on April 8th. That means you get to look at the sun in ways you usually can't. The sun is kind of like Medusa. You can't look directly at her or you'll suffer the consequences. The sun has been there every day of your life and you bask in its glory every chance you get, but you might not really know it as well as you'd think. That's what this SciShow compilation is for, to get to know our warm companion a little bit better, starting with its mysterious origin, Take it away, Reed. Space is packed with all kinds of mysteries. That's part of what makes it cool. Some of those mysteries, though, are closer to home than others. Like, here's a surprising one. We actually don't know where the sun came from. According to what we know about star formation, the sun probably formed from a huge cloud of gas along with a bunch of stellar siblings, stars that formed in the same place out of the same stuff. Except we can't find evidence of that cloud or the sun's family anywhere. Our little sun is all on its own. Get your tissues ready, because this is basically waiting to be turned into a Pixar short. Even though we can't find the sun's family, we're pretty confident it has to exist because of how most stars form. The current model requires that a bunch of stars get born together out of a big old gas cloud, called a molecular or giant molecular cloud depending on its size. Eventually, because space is super vicious, the clouds get eaten up or dispersed by their star children. After that, the stars, and their planets if they've accumulated any, might separate or might move together for a while in a so-called open cluster. Then, over time, all the little gravitational pulls and tugs from the member stars build up and finally send the stars on different trajectories. These stars can end up all over a galaxy, but they can still be identified as members of the same family family because they typically have similar ages and often have really similar compositions. There can be plenty of variation within a cluster, but there are still some general trends we can look for. Most stars don't stick around to form open clusters, but we have evidence that the Sun was one of the few who stayed with its family a bit longer. For one thing, the orbital motions of the Kuiper Belt objects, most notably the planetoid Sedna, strongly suggest some gravitational interaction with other stars, probably in a relatively dense group. Otherwise, they likely couldn't have been jostled into their current orbits. There's also evidence, like the excess amount of heavy elements in the Sun and the presence of uranium in the Earth, that there was a supernova near our star when it formed. It could have come from a huge, short-lived member of a larger stellar nursery like an older sibling who peaked too early. We have plenty of reason to believe that the Sun was born in an open cluster, but we can't find anyone else from that stellar nursery, even though we've been looking all over. It's like finding Dory, but with a lot more math. For a while, astronomers thought the Messier 67 open cluster, or M67 for short, was the most likely candidate. It's an open cluster about 2,700 light years away in the Cancer constellation. It's a pretty dense group, which would match our hypotheses, and it's also about 5 billion years old. That's really old for an open cluster, but it's about as old as the Sun. Admittedly, dating stars is really hard, so there are some big error bars on that measurement. But it's in the ballpark, and astronomers love ballparking. So its age and density make M67 a good candidate. But its orbital path around the galaxy is way different from the Sun's, and that's become a big source of debate. On the one hand, this might not be a problem. Because members of open clusters interact gravitationally, Gravitationally, it's possible that a star could get kicked out and end up with some different orbital parameters. But on the other hand, the kind of kick that the Sun would have needed to get on its current path is super huge, like too big for it to have kept its baby solar system. So the fact that we're here is some evidence against the M67 hypothesis. That is, unless that kick happened really early on. An early, gentle nudge, given a lot of time, could have gotten the Sun way off course. So we're still not exactly sure what's going on here. What we could really use is more data. Thankfully, there are a few projects, both launched in 2013, that are helping with that. One is the Gaia mission, run by the European Space Agency, and the other is the GALA project, run by the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Together, they're collecting astrometry and astrochemistry data of a truly enormous quantity of stars or data about their positions, movements, and chemistry. Astrometry is good for finding former and current open clusters because members of them move together. 
And even if the Sun's siblings have dispersed, we could use current star positions to calculate the cluster's original location. Astrochemistry may also prove to be a smoking gun. Since the Sun is so metallic from that supernova explosion, its sibling stars may have similarly high metallicities. All we have to do is find stars that match those descriptions. Gaia is working to get astrometric and astrochemical data on a billion stars from an orbit near Earth. Gala, on the other hand, is just doing astrochemistry on a more modest million stars, and it's operating from the ground. Both missions will wrap up over the next few years. After that, it's up to astronomers to make sense of the mountains of data. Between the two surveys, we're characterizing tons and tons of stars. We haven't found the Sun's siblings yet, but these surveys are currently our best chance at it. Besides being a nice end to a story, Understanding where the Sun originated and what it was like there can also help us understand why our solar system turned out like it did. Still, even if these projects don't give us the data we need to solve the Sun's mystery, they'll give us incredible insights into the formation and evolution of the galaxy. Thanks, Reed. Okay, so we don't really know where the Sun came from, but we do think it has one origin. So how can it have multiple ages? Here's Reed to explain. In the early 1960s, the well-known physicist Richard Feynman said something cool in a lecture. I mean, he said a lot of cool things in his lectures, but what he said this time, according to a transcript published later, was that the center of the Earth should be a day or two younger than the surface. As strange as that sounds, the basic idea behind it makes sense, if you know something about the theory of relativity. And it was Feynman saying this, so people kept quoting him in lectures and textbooks, and nobody really questioned it. That is, until April 2016, when three Danish physicists actually did the math and realized that Feynman was wrong. The center of the Earth isn't a day or two younger than the surface. It's two and a half years younger. And the center of the Sun? It's 39,000 years younger than its surface. All because of general relativity. General relativity is basically the science of the very fast and the very massive. It takes the big picture universe, like planets, stars, and galaxies, and describes it using math. That math is built around a few fundamental ideas. One of those ideas is that the speed of light in a vacuum is always the same. It's about 300,000 kilometers per second, no matter what perspective you're looking at it from. And that rule, that the speed of light is set, can seriously mess with both time and space if you start to consider situations that are way more extreme than your everyday life on Earth. For example, when you're traveling close to the speed of light, say in some hypothetical ridiculously fast train, time will pass more slowly for you than for someone standing on the ground watching you zoom past. Relativity shows that space and time are so closely interconnected that you can really think of them as parts of the same thing. That's space-time. And another thing relativity shows is that something with a lot of mass, like Earth or the Sun, will warp space-time. One of the effects of this warping is that the closer you get to the center of one of these massive objects, the slower time will pass. It's a brain-bendy idea, but we know it's true. We have to correct GPS systems because of it. GPS satellites orbit Earth from about 20,000 kilometers up, so they're much farther from the Earth's center than we are on the ground. That means that time passes a little more quickly for a GPS satellite than for us. It's a tiny difference, which adds up to only about 38 millionths of a second per day. But for the satellites to keep track of your position, their clocks need to be synced up pretty much exactly. So GPS satellites are designed to take relativity into account and correct their clocks. And this is the same basic idea Feynman pointed out in his lecture. If something with lots of mass warps spacetime, and if time passes more slowly, the closer closer you are to the Earth's center, that means that the center of the Earth must be younger than the surface. And that part was right. The thing is, he said that in the 4.5 billion years or so that Earth's been around, the center would be younger than the surface by a day or two. And no one checked his math for more than 50 years, until that group of Danish physicists decided to look into it, in a paper published in the European Journal of Physics. First, they did a simpler version of the calculation, using equations that treated Earth like a uniformly dense sphere. Which it's not, by the way because of all those different layers of rock. But it's still a pretty good way to get a sense of the physics, and that's probably how Feynman would have done the calculations. They found that the center of the Earth would be about a year and a half younger than the surface, which was their first sign that Feynman's famous fact 
was wrong. Next, the team did a more detailed calculation, using a model that takes into account the variations in Earth's density. That gave them a more exact answer. Earth's center is about 2.5 years younger than its surface. It's hard to know whether Feynman himself was wrong, or whether the people transcribing his lectures just wrote down day instead of year. But either way, the fact that people kept repeating it in all those lectures and textbooks was wrong. While they were at it, the Danish researchers did the same detailed calculation for the sun, since there's a similar model for the sun's density they could use. And that found that the sun's center is about 39,000 years younger than its surface, which is a much bigger age difference than for the Earth. A lot of that is because much more of the sun's mass is concentrated close to its center, and warp spacetime so much more. Practically speaking, the fact that time passes more slowly at the center of the Earth and the sun doesn't really matter that much. But Relativity is one of our most useful tools for learning about the universe, so it's important to understand the way it affects everything around us. Fascinating stuff, Reed. Thank you. So the inside of the sun is very different from the outside to the point where they're tens of thousands of years apart in age. And that's not the only surprise hiding inside the sun. Here's how we found there's an element in there that really shouldn't be able to exist in that environment. And here's Reed to tell you about it. We've known about all the naturally occurring elements for at least 80 years, from the familiar ones like iron and carbon to the very last one we found, francium. Most of these elements were discovered by doing clever chemistry, but the second most abundant element in the universe also has one of the most unique stories. Helium was discovered in space before it was found on Earth. And it took nearly three decades for scientists to accept that it could actually exist. The now famous balloon filler and squeaky voice maker was first discovered in the atmosphere of the sun back in the 1860s. Around the same time, Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev was making what would soon become the standard periodic table by categorizing the known elements by their chemical properties. He even left gaps in his table for elements he predicted would be discovered someday. But Mendeleev's table didn't include the group of elements we now call the noble gases, or even a gap for them, because no one had ever seen one. Helium is one of these noble gases, elements that are incredibly unreactive. It's a struggle to do any chemistry with them at all, making them hard to detect. It doesn't help that Earth's atmosphere is only about five parts per million helium either. But in space, it's different. If you could look at the universe as a whole, you would find that 75% of it is hydrogen and 25% is helium, and everything else is negligible. The sun's composition is similar. So how can you detect an unknown element that doesn't react with anything and basically only exists in space in the 19th century? The answer lies in a technique called spectroscopy. If you put sunlight through a prism, you get a spectrum of light, with the visible part showing up as a rainbow. In 1815, a German physicist named Joseph von Fraunhofer discovered something unexpected. The spectrum had holes in it. Fraunhofer had seen dark lines at very precise points in the spectrum that looked kind of like a barcode. These lines only appeared in sunlight, so they also acted like a barcode. You could distinguish sunlight from other types of light by looking at the spectrum. Fraunhofer labeled these lines A, B, C, and so on. And 50 years later, two scientists, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen, made a revolutionary discovery about these lines using Bunsen's new invention, the Bunsen burner. By burning different elements, Kirchhoff and Bunsen discovered that each one had a unique collection of dark lines a unique spectrum. They also worked out that this spectrum was due to elements absorbing light, but only at specific wavelengths. And what's more, some of the elements' lines matched the lines that came from sunlight. The sun spectrum was composed of the spectrums of other elements. For instance, the two lines that Fraunhofer labeled D1 and D2 were in the yellow region of the solar spectrum, and they also appeared in the spectrum of sodium. So Bunsen and Kirchhoff concluded that the D lines from the sunlight must have been caused by small amounts of sodium in the sun. And they were right. Once they realized they could identify elements in the sun using spectroscopy, other scientists got to work studying the solar spectrum, looking for more lines that Fraunhofer missed. There are lots of solar spectrum lines, but one line would soon stand out. In 1868, two researchers independently studied a solar eclipse. 
The eclipse blocked light from the main part of the sun, allowing them to get a clear spectrum from the sun's outermost layer, the corona. From this, they both detected a line near the two well-known sodium D lines, called D3. One of these researchers later realized that the line wasn't from sodium, or from any known element. And so he made the bold claim that it must have been from an unknown element. He named it helium after Helios, the Greek sun god. He just discovered a new element without ever getting his hands on the stuff. For a while, this discovery was controversial. How could you detect an element without a sample? Besides, Mendeleev's periodic table had no room for a new element like this. Some said the new line was just a hydrogen line that they'd previously missed. Because helium is so rare and unreactive, it was hard to isolate a sample. Eventually, in 1895, a chemist at University College London isolated an element formed in the radioactive decay of uranium. This element had the distinctive D3 line, so he concluded it had to be helium. He was actually looking for a different noble gas, argon, at the time, which he eventually found. After the discovery of helium and argon, Mendeleev was convinced to add the two noble gases to a new grouping on his periodic table. All these discoveries were made before scientists knew why spectrums work this way. The answer turns out to be our old friend, quantum mechanics. We now know that atoms can only absorb and emit particles of light, aka photons, if those photons are at certain specific wavelengths. The precise wavelengths are unique to each type of atom, so every atom has a different spectrum that can be used to identify it. During the eclipse, researchers were seeing helium atoms in the sun's outer layer absorbing light emitted from the lower layers, and the absorption was happening only at distinct wavelengths. Today, we can use spectroscopy to learn about the composition of all kinds of things we wouldn't know much about otherwise. In some ways, we have more information about the composition of distant galaxies than about the stuff in the core of our own planet. Telescopes are also starting to be advanced enough for us to use spectroscopy to study the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars. Gosh, that guy's handsome. Moving on, though, I guess we can't expect to know everything about the part of the sun that's most tucked away. But we should definitely know way more about the outside. After all, it's right out there for anyone to explore. But it turns out that even the outermost layers of the sun still have some intrigue to them. Like, we still don't know for sure why the sun's corona is so hot. Speaking of hot, here's Reed to tell us more. If you've seen any pictures from the recent solar eclipse, you've probably noticed a big, wispy halo shining from behind the moon. That's the corona, the outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere, and it's pretty sweet. It's also home to one of the biggest mysteries in astronomy. Even though the corona is the top layer of the sun's atmosphere, it's hundreds of times hotter than the surface, a whopping one to four million degrees Celsius, compared to about 5,500 degrees. Astronomers have done enough research to give them some ideas why, but to really figure it out, they're getting ready to send a probe into the fires of the sun itself. The corona is so thin that the rest of the sun's light usually outshines it, which is why you can only see it clearly from Earth during an eclipse. It's also enormous, extending millions of kilometers above the sun's surface. Like the rest of the sun, the corona is made of plasma, which is basically a charged gas that forms when atoms become so hot that their electrons break free from their orbits. For the corona to be as hot as it is, astronomers think there has to be some totally different kind of heating mechanism happening there, because usually it gets colder the farther you get from a heat source. One popular idea is that it involves wave heating, where strong waves of energy are created by turbulence on the sun's surface and then travel out to the corona. These waves move kind of like ocean waves, except that instead of water, there are ions and electrons in the plasma moving back and forth. And whenever those charged particles move, they also create a magnetic field. The field doesn't move exactly the same way as the particles, but it can change strength and direction as the wave travels, and the magnetism also gives the wave some extra energy. According to this hypothesis, as as the waves move away from the sun, all that energy eventually turns into heat that makes the corona all nice and cozy. But 
that still might not be enough to make the corona as hot as it is. In 2011, scientists studying the sun's transition zone, the region of the sun's atmosphere just below the corona, found that wave heating could be enough to get the corona to the bottom of its temperature range, or about a million degrees Celsius. But when there's a lot of solar activity, the corona can get up to four times hotter than that, so something has to be causing the extra boost. To help explain it, astronomers have another hypothesis called magnetic reconnection, which happens when pockets of magnetism in the sun's plasma connect and release a ton of energy. These pockets are called magnetic domains, and they're regions where the magnetic fields line up, so they're pointing in the same direction. Here on Earth, this happens all the time when rocks or metals become magnetized. But because those domains are in solid materials, they don't interact in the same way. On the sun, because there's all that plasma swirling around, magnetic domains can come into contact with each other. And when they do, things get kind of weird. Usually, when magnetic fields combine, we can predict the outcome. But with magnetic reconnection, there's all kinds of weird bending and stretching to throw off our calculations. That's because there are a lot of other factors involved that we usually don't have to deal with on Earth, like the fact that the sun is rotating and plasma is moving around all over the place, which creates a constantly changing system we don't totally understand yet. One thing we do know is that when two domains collide that were lined up in opposite directions, they annihilate each other and release a huge amount of heat energy. And that might be enough to boost the corona to those higher temperatures. We're not positive these two ideas explain everything, or even if that's really what's happening in the corona. Instead, there might be a lot of smaller mechanisms we don't know about. So, to gather more data, NASA is about to fly a probe into the sun. It's called the Parker Solar Probe, and it'll have a bunch of instruments to study things like coronal heating, magnetism, and plasma dynamics. To get that data, the probe will fly within 6 million kilometers of the sun, which is closer than we've ever been before. The probe's sweep instrument, which stands for solar, wind, electrons, alphas, and protons, will gather information on what's going on in the corona, which, along with tons of observations from the ground, will hopefully tell us why it's so hot. The Parker Solar Probe isn't scheduled to launch until summer 2018, so we'll just have to hang tight until then. Whew. Guy gets me every time. Now, while we don't have a definite answer for why the corona is so hot, we know that it is indeed very warm. But if it's so hot on the sun, how did they find water there? Well, here's Stefan, who can explain. Goodness gracious, the sun's a great ball of fire. Well, okay, it's more like a giant ball of hydrogen and helium plasma, plus a sprinkling of other ingredients all swirling around at temperatures that would feel like taking a blowtorch to the face. But one of those ingredients might sound a little weird. It turns out, after decades of debate, astronomers found evidence of water on the sun. Water is all over the solar system. In fact, some water molecules are older than the solar system itself. They were just hanging out in a big cloud of dust and gas, which eventually collapsed into a bunch of smaller bodies. So of course the sun, which holds over 99% of the solar system's mass, had to have scooped up some of that water when it formed. The question was, could those molecules stay water? Or were the scorching temperatures so high that every bit of H2O was doomed to crack apart into hydrogen and oxygen? The sun has an average surface temperature of about 5,500 degrees Celsius, which, yeah, is too hot. But I did just say average. See these dark patches? They are sunspots. And they look darker than the surrounding bits because they're cooler, only around 3,500 degrees Celsius. Which is still hotter than a sauna that I would visit, but it's cool enough for water molecules to survive, in vaporized form. But just because water vapor can survive there doesn't mean it's actually there. Hence the long and arduous hunt for water on the sun. Now, scientists can figure out a star's composition using spectroscopy, measuring the exact blend of light wavelengths that the star gives off. Every element and molecule has its own unique spectroscopic signature, but water's is a bit complicated. At certain wavelengths, it can look eerily similar to other chemical compounds that are very much not water. So around the turn of the 20th century, some scientists were arguing over what compounds they were actually spotting in sunspots. Like, was it water or was it titanium? Then in the 1970s, astronomers detected water vapor's signature in the light of red giant stars. These stars 
are red because their surfaces are way cooler than our suns. In fact, their average surface temperature is in the same range as the sun's sunspots. And finally, in the 1990s, scientists found what they were looking for. H2O can indeed hang out in those cooler, darker patches. Now, this might all sound like just a bit of fun, counterintuitive trivia that water can exist atop a fiery ball of plasma. But this fact can seriously complicate our exploration of worlds beyond this solar system. By watching a planet pass in front of its star and measuring how starlight gets filtered through the planet's atmosphere, astronomers can figure out what the atmosphere is made of. And as you may have guessed, one of the compounds they want to find is water. But any detection of water vapor has to come with a caveat. The signal could be coming from the planet's atmosphere, or it could be coming from the stars. So if you hear a bit of news announcing that we found water on another world, maybe pause and wonder whether that water is actually on a star. Okay, so there's water on the sun. <laughs> Next, you'll tell me it's green. How gullible do you think I am? Wait, it is green? I don't know, Stefan. So obviously, the sun is yellow, right? That's the color we use when we draw it out on a piece of paper, maybe with some rays shooting out and a cool and kind of confusing pair of sunglasses on its face. Why is it wearing sunglasses if all the light is coming from the thing itself? It's kind of weird. But anyways, clearly the sun is yellow, or maybe some sort of yellowish white that we draw as yellow because that's the closest crayon. Except when you split up sunlight, you get a lot of colors, and yellow is not the strongest. In the most well-actually sense, the sun turns out to be green. Now, no one uses a green crayon for the sun, which means the sun isn't really green. If no human can see sunlight as green, then sunlight isn't green. Colors are in our brains, not in the world. But light is in the world. And light from the sun comes in all different wavelengths, different lengths passing between peaks as the light wave wiggles up and down on its way from the sun to our eyes. Understanding those wavelengths helps us understand why the sun shines in the first place, and why we can say that sunlight peaks in the green even though the sun isn't green. Different wavelengths of light interact with objects in different ways, which is why shining a flashlight at an antenna doesn't affect radio reception. The antenna works because long wavelength radio waves push around electrons inside it. But those electrons don't respond to shortish wavelength visible light. Atoms and molecules move differently when different kinds of light hit them. They're like swings. They only respond when they're kicked by light wiggling at the right rate. Conversely, they also give off different wavelengths depending on how they move around. Each kind of movement gives off its own kind of light. If only one or two kinds of movement are happening at once, you get something like a laser, where all the light coming out has the same wavelength. Now, I promise that we'll get back to the sun and its sunglasses, but first we have to understand why stuff makes light. Because atoms and molecules don't generally just move in one or two ways. Otherwise, lasers would be a lot more common. They also move around randomly, and we measure the amount of random motion as something's temperature. Higher temperature means more random motion, and more kinds of light being emitted. The range of random light coming off of an object is called its black body spectrum. Stars like the sun give off most of their energy in the infrared, even if they peak or have the highest intensity in the visible range. So it's it's not like the sun gives off just one color. When we're talking visible light, it happens to give off more green wavelengths than any other individual color. The difference isn't that huge, though. Red, yellow, green, and blue just aren't that physically different. The main place they feel different is down here on Earth. Most sunlight might be infrared, but if our eyes had evolved to see in the infrared, they'd see themselves, since we give off infrared too. Which, hey, maybe that's why the sun wears sunglasses. Instead, evolution shifted our vision a bit. We evolved to see sunlight as neutral illumination, since otherwise the world would have always looked tinted in one way or another. And that would have been annoying, or dangerous, or whatever. Except now it feels like we took a step backward. Now we have three colors. We use yellow crayons to illustrate a green sun that millions of years of evolution should have trained us to see as white. But white sunlight gets altered by our atmosphere, where blue light bounces off air molecules more easily than red light does. This scatters blue throughout the air and leaves yellower, red light closer to the sun in the sky. The lower the sun is in the sky, the more atmosphere the light passes through, and the more blues are bounced away, leaving us with red and orange sunsets around a yellow-tinged sun. Combine that with the fact that it's just no fun to draw a sun without coloring it in, and that probably explains yellow suns even when the sun should be white when it's higher in the sky. And yet, we don't usually perceive green anywhere in the normal sky, even though sunlight peaks in that color. Why is it that all that green light enters our eyes? 
eyes, but our brains don't show it to us. Well, the color-detecting cones in our eyes evolved to respond to three colors— red, green, and blue. But the best red for red cones is pretty similar to the best green for green cones. Most reddish, orangish, yellowish, greenish light activates both of them. So sunlight with lots of red and yellow and green can't really appear uniquely green to us. There's too much other color fighting for our attention. So the sun is yellow, and it's green, and white, and really it's mostly infrared. The black body spectrum covers all colors, visible and invisible, so sunlight is any color you want it to be. Because again, colors are in here, not out there. The sun cannot be confined to just one color. Or at least not as it is today. The future may look a little different. And here's a sneak peek from Reed 10 years ago. If you're at all like me, you enjoy the sun, and are a big fan of its work. We all depend on our nearest star to keep Earth at just the right temperature to sustain life. And that just right temperature is a function of the sun's luminosity. People often use luminosity as a synonym for brightness, but that's not really what it is. Luminosity actually describes the total amount of energy released by a celestial object every second. Now, it may not surprise you that the sun hasn't always had the same luminosity that it has now, and I'd rather you hear this from me than anyone else. It definitely won't stay the same in the future. There, there. I know. Currently a middle-aged 4.5 billion year old star, the sun will spend the next 7.7 .7 billion years getting bigger, hotter, brighter, cooler, changing color, and eventually transforming into a white dwarf, all while doing its best to destroy the Earth. At which it may or may not succeed, we're not really sure. I mean, as a chunk of rock hurtling through space, Earth might survive all the sun's upcoming shenanigans. But us, and everything that's alive on it, not so much. Let's start with the sun that we know and love today. It's currently what's known as a main sequence star, which means that it's fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. Not all stars do this, and the sun won't do it forever. As the sun ages, its core fills up with helium that it can't fuse. And as the helium builds up, the core starts to shrink, which makes it burn even hotter. As a result, the sun starts burning through its hydrogen more quickly. That extra heat from the fusion going faster trickles out through the outer layers of the sun called its envelope. And all this rising heat gradually makes our star larger, hotter, and more luminous. This whole process I'm talking about is going on right now in the sun, but extremely slowly. Today, the luminosity of the sun is increasing by about 1% every 100 million years. But if you do the math, you'll realize that after 1 billion years, the luminosity of the sun will have increased by over 10%. It might not sound like much, but trust me, it's enough to put a real hurtin' on the Earth. A 10% increase in the sun's luminosity will make the Earth so hot that the oceans will start evaporating. And it won't end there. Water vapor, like CO2, is a greenhouse gas, so all that extra water vapor in the atmosphere will set off a runaway greenhouse effect. As the planet warms, the oceans will evaporate faster, putting even more water vapor into the atmosphere, which will warm the planet faster still. It's a classic case of positive feedback, and it'll keep going until the oceans boil away completely. So, not only will there not be any liquid water on future Earth, but the molecules of that evaporated water will also find their way to the upper atmosphere. There, the sun's ultraviolet radiation will break off atoms of hydrogen, which will be permanently lost to space. With the hydrogen gone, the water molecules will never be able to reform, and the Earth will dry out. Permanently. So, let's get this out of the way right now. Even if humans have managed to stick around by this time, the changes in the sun will render Earth completely uninhabitable in about a billion years. So, you know, start planning accordingly. But the sun will still have a long way to go before it reaches the end of its lifespan. And even though it won't be habitable, Earth might still exist at least for a while. Because at this point, the sun is just beginning to get bigger and more luminous. It won't be until five and a half billion years from now that the sun will run out of hydrogen in its core and end its main sequence lifetime. That doesn't mean it'll be totally out of hydrogen. There just won't be any in its core. But there'll be a ton of fuel left in the region around the core. And that reserve of fuel will keep on fusing, marking the beginning of the next phase of the sun's evolution. A shell of fusing hydrogen around the sun's core will start pumping massive amounts of heat into the sun's envelope. And just like a hot air balloon, the hot gas in the envelope will expand. This will make the sun expand very rapidly. And although the core will be hotter than ever, because the sun has expanded so much, its surface will be a lot cooler around 3,000 Kelvin. Combine the increasing size and cooler surface, which by now has turned from white to red, and you get a giant red star that experts call a 
red giant star. In this phase, the sun's luminosity and radius will continue to grow faster and faster until in about 7.2 billion years, things get crazy fast. By this time, the sun will have become over 2,000 times brighter than it is today and have a radius over 100 times its current size. That's about as big a cross as the entire orbit of Earth. The sun will be so spread out that it'll have only a weak hold on its fluffy outer atmosphere. So soon, it'll start leaking much of its loosely held gas, creating a supercharged version of the sun's current solar wind. Exactly what this means for Earth depends on how the end of this red giant phase plays out. Some models predict that by 7.5 billion years in the future, the sun will have lost up to 30% of its mass. But it's still enormously huge. The ironic sounding fact is, even as a red giant sheds its mass, it keeps getting bigger in radius and even more luminous. But its loss of mass will have some pretty serious consequences for the metro solar system neighborhood because a less massive star will loosen its hold on the planets, causing their orbits to drift outward. If the sun loses enough mass, the Earth could migrate out fast enough to keep pace with the still growing luminosity of the sun and not get totally incinerated. If it does, then the Earth stays pretty safe through the rest of the sun's evolution. But other models show that the tidal interactions between the Earth and the sun could create another effect, a slight bulge in the sun's atmosphere. If this tidal bulge is large enough, it'll slow pull the Earth back in. And if that happens, our planet could be swallowed up by the atmosphere of the Sun and just spiral farther and farther in until it vaporizes. And game over. But in yet another, perhaps more likely scenario, Earth will be able to stay out of the Sun's atmosphere but will still become so hot, up to several thousand Kelvin, that the entire planet will just melt and turn into a sloshing ball of molten rock. At this point, the Sun still has more changes ahead, although it doesn't have a lot of time. In about 7.6 billion years, it'll undergo another dramatic but nearly immediate switch. It'll stop burning hydrogen in its shell and begin fusing helium in its core. This will happen in a near instantaneous event called the helium core flash, when the core temperature finally hits about 100 million Kelvin. This burst of energy restructures the entire inside of the sun in a cosmological blink of an eye, allowing the sun to start fusing helium into carbon and oxygen, which it has never done before. This helium burning phase will go on for about 100 million years until it goes through one last crazy growth spurt. By about 7.7 .7 billion years from now, the core will be full of carbon and oxygen, which it can't generate enough heat to fuse. So it'll be forced to start fusing the remaining hydrogen outside its core into helium again, and then turning that helium into carbon and oxygen again. All this fusion will send the sun hurtling back upward in luminosity and radius, briefly becoming a red giant star one last time. But since its core temperatures will never push high enough to fuse the carbon and oxygen in its core, the sun's lifetime is basically over at the end of this second red giant phase, just over 7.7 .7 billion years from now. The luminosity of the hot carbon and oxygen core will finally push off the small amounts of remaining hydrogen and helium, briefly creating an extended extended shroud of ionized gas called a planetary nebula. The naked core of the sun will have about half the mass it does now, compressed down to about the size of Earth. This is what we call a white dwarf, the remnants of a relatively low mass star like the sun. As for Earth, if it managed to survive the red giant phase, in 7.7 .7 billion years, it will be a smoldering cinder traveling around that white dwarf, which, because of its tiny size, will be too dim to keep Earth warm. Both the Sun and any surviving planets will spend the rest of the lifetime of the universe cooling and fading. After their fiery finale, they will dwindle into cold obscurity. But hey, don't sell off all your stuff or quit your job or tell off your boss or anything, because we still have a good billion years ahead of us. Man, I just keep getting better looking every year. So as it turns out, we have plenty of years left to get to know our sun better. And there are a lot of mysteries we haven't yet solved. So let's make the most of it on April 8th, when the total solar eclipse can be seen in spots across North America. It's a rare opportunity to look directly at our magnificent star.